and encourage others to share as well. Um, I look forward to what you have to say through her um, tonight. And so, Father, we love you. We thank you for this time together, um, and, and we bless what is about to be shared. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Blake. I mean, you got to warn somebody before you're going like, to pray over them. What the heck? <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, to start, we just have to take a moment to recognize that all of my teenage dreams are coming true with this Britney Spears mic. Um, <laughs> They mic'd me backstage, and I was like, okay, this is, this is a moment. I need to really relish in this. Um, so to start, I'm going to tell you about myself, and then I'm going to tell you about you. Because it's always kind of nice when the person that's preaching at you, you know a little bit about them, right? So I just turned 30 in December, which means that I have, my hair is going to smack this thing the whole time I talk about it. Um, I have 10 years of loving Jesus under my belt. 20 was a really big year for me. I became a believer. I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, and I got into an incredible, incredibly unhealthy relationship. Um, it was kind of your standard college unhealthy relationship. We were not compatible. We were combustible. We fed each other lies. We pushed boundaries. We were entirely too reliant on one another. But the unfortunate thing about those early 20, 21, 22 years is they're formative. So to be in that stage of life where you're figuring out who you are and what you believe and what your reactions are to things and to be in a relationship that's kind of consistently feeding you lies, is, it's damaging. It's destructive. I can remember one night literally bawling, crying to him convinced that he wanted me to be like this other girl that was in our group of friends. Convinced that he wanted me to be more quiet, more peaceful, nicer. And I can remember his response literally being, I mean, it wouldn't be like the worst thing. It wouldn't be the worst thing if you were, if you were more like her. That was, <laughs> that, okay, oh no. I'm like an aggressive talker. I'm going to keep like are we good? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, sorry. I can remember, like, literally, I can remember that moment. That was literally almost 10 years ago, and I can remember that kind of embedded itself into the fiber of my identity at that point. It was another suitcase in the baggage that I was very quickly accumulating. And the worst thing about all of it was that in that season, I was basing my identity on three things. I was basing my identity on what people said about me, what was happening to me, and what I was capable of, what I could bring to the table. And even worse than that, I was doing it all completely alone. I was having rolling panic attacks and spending just as much effort to get out of the panic attack as I was to make sure my roommates didn't experience me having a panic attack. I was a new believer. I'd grown up in the church, but this relationship was like mine all of a sudden, and I needed everybody to think that I had it together, that I could do it all, keep it all lined up and pretty. And so I wasn't letting anybody in. I wasn't letting anybody into the junk. Thankfully, that relationship ended, <laughs> and I met my husband, and I dragged an incredible amount of baggage with me, like enough for like a European vacation. Here's me and all my baggage. My anxiety was really bad. I was a mess. And I have no doubt that God gave me my husband in that season to help me kind of undo some of that. And he's been a, a huge tool in healing old wounds and unpacking old baggage. But I kind of got to a crossroads with God where he was like, are we going to keep doing this? Like, is this, this is how we're going to keep doing this? Just believing lies functioning out of lies, and then, like, hiding them. Not always well, but hiding them. So I ended up in counseling. Praise the Lord for therapy. And I sat on her couch, and she asked me why I was there. Now, I can tell you why I thought I was there. I thought I was there to start unpacking all of that old junk, heal wounds, to get better coping mechanisms for my anxiety, I was there to figure out how to be a better mom. I had like a one-year-old at the time. But I sat on a couch, and she asked me why I was there. And the truth that ended up coming out of my mouth was, I think I hate myself. 
I think I hate myself. Like the sum of the things that I am, I really don't like it. And I don't know how, what to do with that. And so we spent the next year unpacking lies, digging them out, and replacing them with the truth of what God actually says about me. Because it's, you can't hate yourself when you're standing in your actual identity of who God says you are. But it's really, really easy to hate the sum of the things that people have said about you or the sum of your experiences. And that's the thing about lies, is you can shine a light on a lie and be like, that's not true. But if you leave it at that, if you leave it at that's a lie, it's still gonna, it's still gonna hurt, you're still gonna struggle with it. What you have to do is like get down and dirty and dig it out. And then you have to repack it with truth. And that is the only way that you can stand on top of it. And that's the only way that you can like link arm in arm with a friend who's struggling with a lie that you have struggled with in the past and pull her up on top of it. In the next session, Kendall's gonna dive into like what really unites us, what really gives us solidarity and that that is our oneness in Christ, our freedom in him. And that if we're not functioning in that, we're really missing out. But I think that for my session, what I wanna talk about is that one, we're not alone in this junk. Cause I think that that is one of the biggest lies that the enemy uses against us. Like, especially as women, we get alone in feeling alone. We don't let our friends in, we don't let our family in, we do our best to not let God in. And when we believe truth about ourselves, then we're capable of solidarity and we're capable of doing life with other people. When I started believing truth about myself, I was no, I no longer, like I couldn't hate myself anymore. And then I like thrived doing life with other people. It was the first time that I experienced like actual friendships. And I think that in this season of feminism and the independent woman, which if you know me, you know that I am here for it. But I think that we're being told that we have to like do all of those things alone. I literally saw on Instagram, like you have to be the hero of your own story. I don't wanna be the hero of my own story. It sounds exhausting. (laughs) Sounds really, really hard. And it's not how we were created to function. So in the time that I have with you, I wanna do two things. I wanna unpack some of the common lies that the enemy uses to render us ineffective, and I wanna replace it with truth. So what are some of the things that we as women tend to believe about ourselves? Believe that we're too much, we're not enough, we have to do it all ourselves, we are unworthy, we are the sum of the things that we bring to the table. And that is like scratching the surface because I only have 30 minutes. (laughs) So let's start with I am too much or not enough. That feels relatively universal. Like you can cast a wide net with that. So you have these two camps of women. You have the women who have been told probably their whole lives that they are too much. They are too loud, they're too opinionated, they rock the boat. And then you have the camp of women who feel like they're not enough. They are too small, they are insignificant. They don't have anything to bring to the table. Those are the lies that they believe about themselves. And the world's message to those two women is really conflicting. So if you land in the camp of not enough, what the world is telling you is that the reality is is that somebody's already doing whatever it is you feel called to and they're probably doing it better. That applies to motherhood, friendship, marriage, ministry, business, literally, whatever you feel called to in your life in that season, and the lie the enemy feeds you is that somebody else is doing it better. And if you land in the camp of too much, which if in the four minutes that I've been on stage, I haven't picked up that that's where I land. Right now in 2019, what the world is telling you is, so, get loud, girl, use your voice, quit apologizing, Railroad if you have to, to get where you want to get. Both messages are destructive. 
And more often than not, what I've found walking through life with people is that the women in these two camps are looking at the other camp, wishing they had that. So from the too much camp, I can tell you that I look at my friends who are naturally more kind and peaceful, and I want that. I look at that camp, and I think, my husband got the short end of this stick. (laughs) Because they seem like naturally better wives, mothers, homemakers, friends. They're a safe place to land. But I also know from doing life with those women that they look at the other camp, and they see natural leaders who don't struggle with anything and that are just blazing a trail and that nothing ever messes with their brains. We are distracted by the lies that we, of what we think we should be and it's making us ineffective. The natural biblical answer for those things would be to land in like Psalms, right? God knitted me together in my innermost being and I am beautifully and wonderfully made. And those things are true. And I hope that you have been flooded with that message. I hope that that sticks and I hope that you know that you are beautifully and wonderfully made, whether your whole life you thought you were too loud or too quiet or whatever. But where I ended up landing was in 2 Corinthians. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and who makes known through us, the fragrance that consists of the knowledge of him in every place. He leads us and makes himself known. He does that whether you're loud or you're quiet. He does it whether you naturally end up on stage or behind the scenes. You are not too much. You are more than enough because God created you exactly the way that he did and he's going to use you to make himself known however the way he made you. And you are doing the kingdom a disservice if you're spending all your time spinning your wheels, trying to figure out what you are or what you should be. Those lies are ways that the enemy tries to block us from letting the Lord lead in triumphal procession to make himself known. So sometimes, like, I need to be sorry. Sometimes I do need to scale it back a little bit. And sometimes there is something that you need to say that is, can only be said by you. Sometimes you do need to step up. But the great thing about serving God is that he's going to do it. He's going to lead the way and make himself known through his perfect and unique expression of himself. And that is like legit one of my favorite things in the whole world. A woman standing in her unique giftings and abilities, not trying to be something that she isn't, not distracted by what everyone around her is doing, just like going for it. That is an unstoppable force, and I think we need more of it, to be honest. So let's say, okay, I can get on board with that. I can get on board with like, I'm not too much, I'm more than enough. But like, not me. Like, you don't know my past. You don't know my present. You don't know the things that I struggle with. Like, I am unworthy. We feel disqualified. We we feel disqualified from God's love, from others' love, from stepping into a place of ministry. Like, we feel unworthy. And I know what makes me feel unworthy. I know what lies the enemy uses to make me feel unworthy. But I wanted more depth. So I asked Instagram, what do you feel makes you unworthy of God's love, of others' love, and of being in any form of ministry? And these were some of the answers I got. That my actions define my worth, that I need to lose weight, that nobody's going to listen anyway, that somebody else can do it better, I'm not a good enough Christian. This is my favorite one. I don't have enough theology knowledge and I am going to ruin Jesus in public. (laughs) And I can tell you, like, if we're doing the whole, like, vulnerability from the stage thing, like, I can struggle with feeling disqualified because I need to feel like I need to lose weight. Because I still carry the weight that I gained with my four-year-old. I don't think it counts as great weight anymore. (laughs) Like, that is the lie that the enemy feeds me. 
you're too fat to be effective for the kingdom. And the world's answer to this, to the struggle of feeling unworthy, is like, girl, you're worthy, but you're worthy because you work real hard. You're worthy because you're a good person. You're worthy because you make X amount of dollars, or you drive this car, or you have this many followers on Instagram. That is what the world tells us, and that is fleeting. And that is real dependent on me and my mood that day. That is real dependent on me to, like, wake up and, like, make myself feel worthy. That feels like a lot of work. And the really great news for that is that, like, God doesn't just say we're worthy. He made us worthy. It's transactional if you think about it. What you pay for something is what it's worth, right? Okay, so like these are, these are my fancy jeans. I realize they have holes in the knees. It's like a thing millennials are doing. It's fine. But like these are like my $50 jeans. They've lasted me a pretty good while. They're going to continue to last me. They're going to they're gonna serve me better than my $12 old navy jeans that like the thighs blow out in like a month, <laughs> right? They are worth what I paid for them. And I realize, like, math is hard and it's not my strong suit, but I'm pretty sure that if what we were paid for with was the life of Christ on the cross, then that would mean that we have equal worth in the kingdom to Jesus, right? What you pay for something is what it's worth. Colossians 1.12 says, And always thanking the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. It doesn't say, and always thanking the Father who gave me a list of things I have to do. It says qualified. Ooh, okay. It's an economy of grace rather than our character. It's an economy of grace rather than what we bring to the table. You can't hustle yourself into grace. You can't hustle yourself into being more qualified or worthy. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what you struggle with today. It doesn't mean, matter what you're going to experience five years from now. You're qualified. And believing that we are unworthy makes it really difficult to function in this, like, abundant love that God is pouring down on us. And then it makes it really difficult to extend it to others. You are worthy and qualified in the kingdom because Jesus died on the cross. End of story. It's kind of the whole point. And if we're walking around all like, woe is me, I am unworthy, I am no good, like that's not cute. Like that does not make people wanna like buy in on Jesus. If your whole thing is, man, I'm just the worst. Like, yes, we struggle. Yes, we have like less than attractive qualities sometimes. We are oh, we're qualified. We are worthy. Like that is the end of the story. And here's the thing. We can do all this like work of like digging up the lie and replacing it with truth. But if we're trying to go at it alone, it's going to be really hard and I'm speaking from so much experience, it's embarrassing. This is, this is the one that I struggle with, big time. It's pride. It's 100% pride. I'm a relatively capable human being, kind of smart. I'm, like, kind of witty. Like, I'm going to make a go of it on my own without God. And I don't know why, because I always crash and burn. I always end up like, oh, things are so much better when I, like, function out of your goodness. I don't know why I keep doing this. Live in me, make your home in me, just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. And yes, that was the message version, but I just really liked it. I struggle with this so much, I had it tattooed on my body. He is the vine, you are the branch. Stop trying to do it on your own. 
And I just feel like I need to clarify that you're always joined to the vine. Once you trusted Christ with your life, you were joined to the vine, that can't be undone. But what can happen is that you cannot function in his goodness. You cannot choose to trust that he's gonna lead the way. And when that happens, you don't experience producing fruit. And the people in your life don't experience the like perfect Christ expression of you producing fruit. I'm like, why do we do that? Who wants to live a life like that when we have this constant source of abundant life and that he's freely and willingly just like pouring it out on us? Why do we keep trying to do it alone? Because the thing is, is that that functions that way. But if I am not trusting Christ in a season, I am significantly more likely to do life completely on my own this way in community. And the thing is, is that we were created for community. We're literally created to do life with the other members of the body. So whether you think you don't need it, it's my lie. Whether you think you don't deserve it, whether you think I've tried it and it didn't go well, I do want to challenge you. And I could be the only one that struggles with this, so I'm just going to preach to myself. It's fine. But, like, if you struggle with, like, functioning in community with other people, like, I want to challenge you to, like, just make an effort. One person. Find one person to pull into your junk with you and to step into theirs with them. Speak truth to each other. Challenge one another because it's addictive. You're going to get that one, and you're going to be like, oh, I want more of this. I need, I need to do this with more people. And it's so good, and it's so life-giving, and your husband doesn't count. Because I love my husband, but he's a dude. Like, you just need another woman to do this kind of stuff with. So the enemy is going to keep lying to you. And that's, that's kind of his thing. Because he can't create, but he, can, he spends all of his energy trying to warp and weasel and destroy. He's going to keep trying to tell you that you are identified by your past struggles. You are identified by the things that you struggle with today. Even though you know truth, even though you know Jesus, you can have six years of loving Jesus actively under your belt and still be prisoner to those lies. He's going to keep telling you that you're alone. So we're going to take that off the table as an option. Women's ministry, can you come grab these papers, please? Okay, so we're passing out some papers. When you get them, don't have a heart attack, please. I'm not making you like, you're not going to like put your name on them and like walk up here and read it off, okay? So what we're going to do is we are going to reclaim the experiences and the struggles that we have encountered in our lives. Hannah, I forgot to keep one. <laughs> Thanks. So what I want you to do is go through the paper and circle the things that you have experienced or currently struggle with. seeing lots of eyeballs. Are you all done? Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to fold it in half. 
and then like fold it in half again. And then I want you to pass it three times backwards. Okay, now pass it like twice over, two people over. Pass them forward if you're in the back. Just like pass it to random people. You should have no idea where your paper is. We have two more back there. Raise your hand if you don't have a paper in your hand. Does anybody not have a paper? Everybody have a paper. Okay, so you have no idea where your paper is. You have no idea where your paper came from. So this this exercise, as it says on top, is called Stand Up for Your Sister. And I, can, I went through this exercise. I've actually gone through it multiple times. But I can remember the first time I circled the, like, I struggle with anxiety. And we do the, like, very confusing, like, passing it around. And I remember being like, oh, my God, one person is going to stand up. And, like, nobody else is going to know it's anxiety. Like, I'm going to know it's mine. And the entire room stood up. And I can remember, like, literally starting to cry. Like, the enemy wants us to believe that we are alone. He wants us to believe that we are the only people who have or are experiencing something. So you're going to stand up for your sister. You're going to open up your paper. And I'm going to read them off. And if your paper has the thing circled, you're going to stand up. I have struggled with feeling like too much. If it's circled on your paper. Okay. I have struggled with feeling like not enough. I hate my body. I mean, if yours isn't circled, you sit. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I'm reading it, and then if I read the next one and it's not circled, you sit. Okay. I have struggled with feeling like I don't belong. I have struggled with anxiety. Make sure you're, like, looking around the room as we do this, because this is crazy. I have struggled with depression. I have struggled with addiction. I have struggled with fear of or experienced rejection. I've been in an unhealthy relationship. I have struggled to generally like myself. It's crazy, y'all. It's crazy. Y'all can sit. All of the things that we just stood up for have already been conquered whether they're current or they're past. They literally died on the cross. The battle is won. The war is over. Victory is ours. And the enemy wants to keep this stuff. He wants to keep it as this like cool little trick he gets to play on us. I'm saying enough. I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to feel alone in my junk. I don't want to feel like I'm the only one that struggles with stuff. I want to pull people into it with me. That's all I got. I'm going to pray for y'all. Thank you so much for being here, for, like, signing up to a, come to a conference where you, like, didn't know the person that was speaking. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for these women who showed up. Father, I pray that truth was heard, 
that an impact was made. Lord, I pray that chains were broken and that the process of digging up lies and replacing it with truth was started for those who need it. Father, we pray that as we leave, that the next time we're driving down airlines stuck in traffic, that you remind us that we're not alone when the enemy starts to try to use that lie. That the next time that that thought starts to creep in, that you are alone in your stuff, that I'm the only one, that you would remind us of this night, that you would remind us of this exercise and this moment where we looked around a room and saw that is just a lie. It's a lie. Father, we thank you that our inheritance is with you. We thank you that you made us worthy and equal with Christ. We thank you for literally pulling us out of the grave and placing us next to you. It's your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> so good.